Thank you. Thank you. All right. It's a great pleasure to be here. I was thinking when you're, you were doing the introduction, um, I was thinking about this one key word, change and trust. And I was wondering if uh, this topic of trust and technology is something that we can look at together today, because I think what's really happening today is that technology is taking over parts of our lives in a very, very quick way. Most of that is pretty positive, and other ones are, other situations are where we are thinking, can we really trust technology? And if you see, uh, last week was Google's big event, Google I.O., and what they came up with was a device that you can speak into that's called Google Home, right? that actually does things for you, a digital assistant. And I was thinking, like, if I leave this box on at home, do I really trust that device with all this information, right? all the details? And where is it going? Is it going to some sort of global brain? So there's a lot of things that we have to discuss about this, because really what's happening is that we're heading towards a future of exponential change. And exponential is the opposite, of course, of linear. So if you count exponentially, one, two, three, four, and so on, you end up at exponentially as many numbers. So not to five, but to 64, 128. If you count seven times, you're already at over 100. If you count 30 times, you're over a billion. And this is what's happening today, is that technology is moving exponentially fast. And we are sometimes thinking that we're only at the beginning of the curve, like a paperless office, a self-driving car. But now we're at the takeoff point, which means, for example, automatic language translation. You know, you can speak already using apps like Google Translate and, and Stay High and other ones, where all of a sudden you can speak in, in 34 languages. I had a real life conversation with a Japanese sushi chef. You know, six weeks ago, I spoke in German and he spoke in Japanese back and forth. Perfect for dating, by the way. Um, if you're so inclined. So what's happening here today that all of a sudden that science fiction is becoming science fact. Not all the time everywhere, but increasingly fast. And that really means for us is that we're coming into an era where impossible becomes doable. And as I said before, 90% of that is kind of positive. Like we have Teslas now, right? We have electric cars, so we have car sharing, we have apps, we have genetic engineering, we have all this fancy technology. But other stuff is really interesting, like having nanobots in your bloodstream to fix your cholesterol, uh, to have brain-computer interfaces, to have robots doing things that we used to do, to have bionic artificial limbs, uh, self-driving cars, and of course, new ways to see the world. This is Microsoft HoloLens, and we have a great VR presentation today, by the way, quite similar idea, to see the world with new eyes. And this is going to be uh, becoming a standard for doctors, lawyers, policemen, and various other professions, you know, who want sort of the augmented view of the world. And that really ends up at this place, right? It ends up at a place to where we're saying, like, we're, we're becoming as God, right? I mean, it's an interesting, we become like superhuman using technology. We can do things all of a sudden that used to be impossible to do. And now many companies are saying, wow, now imagine if we use something like IBM Watson, you know, artificial intelligence, we can do our entire bookkeeping or human resources using a machine, and then one person runs the machine, we can lay off all the rest. And that's a trend you're seeing. I mean, Norway is going to be very, very heavily hit by the decline of the oil industry. Of course, you've been discussing that, I'm sure. Imagine if this happens at the same time that you have automation, robotization, and all the other what I call the Asians happening at the same time. Great opportunity and great challenges at the same time. So, these waves of changes are really coming up in, across all industries, and it's really disruptive in many ways. Uh, I started in the music business, you know, I, I was part of the whole discussion about music going to the cloud. And when we started talking about this, you know, in the late 90s, the record labels all said, no, that may very well end up music in the cloud, like Spotify, but we are not going to allow it. Right? And they sued 257,000 people, and in over 10 years, 75% of revenues were lost to the music business. And now recorded music doesn't really exist. It's now all streaming, right? It's now no longer plastic products. So you're going to see this wave of change coming up in this order, right? Information, content, data, books, print, all the way down to energy and utilities, water and food. It just takes longer. But these are primarily huge opportunities, but of course we're going to have to figure out what we do about this, how we actually 
create new business models. Because this is a certainty, right? Business as usual is dead or dying. The television business is a great example. Your kids, if you're around 30 years old today, your kids will not even know what a television in the sense of the box the television is, right? It's just a way to see media. It could be any screen. It could be in the bathroom, it could be in the car. Uh, many of your kids will not know how to drive a car with a clutch or a car without a computer. They certainly will not buy CDs, right? That's for, that's for sure. So we're heading into a future where we really have to uh, anticipate what is happening in the next five years. So all of us need to spend more time on looking at the future. Uh, Deloitte has a fantastic graph on this, just came out a couple of days ago, this report on disruption. Actually, it was from last year, but this graph has been updated. So really what's happening here is this is very important for if you run a business, because you have a core business, and sometimes when you run a business, you're always saying, okay, this used to work just fine for 20 years, so I'm assuming it will be fine in five years, just make some changes. And, right? But the thing is, today, a lot of businesses don't last as long as they used to because the model is changing. I mean, if you're in the music business, where, where I come from, right, you're not selling music, and you cannot sell music because it's free. Right? I mean, YouTube is free, Spotify is what, uh, eight euros a month for 18 million songs? Right? How in the world will you sell music? It's like bringing, selling uh, ice to the people in Greenland, you know? It's like everybody has it. So now we, have to, we are forced to look at what's the edge of the business, your new things that we haven't thought of. New things that may be completely outside, and those edges are becoming sort of growing, and then over the time, the edge becomes the new normal. Now, if Volkswagen had done this six years ago, they would have said, well, right now the electric car and self-driving, that's kind of really the edge. Nobody cares, right? But turns out it's the future, and they missed the boat. Right? Volkswagen could very easily be the next Nokia. So there's a way of looking at this and saying, how do we actually do this hybrid thinking? For example, in the pharma business, right? Uh, you're looking at this uh, current scenario where roughly about $17 trillion of uh, revenues are being created uh, by selling pills, right? You have a problem, diabetes or higher blood pressure, you take a pill. Right? That's the old pharma business. In the future, it's not taking the pill, it's using technology to avoid the disease. Now imagine that for, for a change, right? You're selling $17 trillion worth of pills. Most of us are taking one pill or the other, right? And all of a sudden, it's going to be technology replacing and, and actually fixing the problem. That's really quite dangerous to stay in a future that's linear. So no matter if you're in government or the oil business or uh, the fishery business or whatever, you have to look beyond the obvious because the changes are really mind-boggling. I mean, just today, uh, I, I got this graphs from just last night for uh, two industries. The car companies are very heavily investing in technology because they're now forced to, and the banks are investing in startups, hundreds of millions of dollars, right? basically funding their own future. So one of the key points here is this one. Humanity and technology are essentially converging. You may have heard about the singularity or transhumanism. I am not in favor of either one of those, but we'll discuss that later on the panel. I think a human converging with technology will probably not be a very uh, valuable human in the future, but that's a larger debate. Right now what's happening is that we have all these things going on. I call this hell then, right? Hell and heaven. I mean, it could be fantastic if we can use technology to be faster, to work faster, to be more efficient, to know more. And we can. But if we become technology, that means we cannot function without technology, are we still human? For example, in, in the US, there's already a term for this called wired or fired. Right? So you go to work, you either augment yourself and you use technology, and in the future that will be including implants and things like that, or you don't have a job. Something we'll discuss later what that means, mm -hmm. but Bob, here's a great video from IBM. It's impressive because Bob Dylan is in it, but basically IBM Watson is one of those companies that is driving this change from using computing devices called deep learning, cognitive computing, uh, to actually replace human activities. Bob Dylan, to improve my language skills, I've read all your lyrics. You've read all of my lyrics. I can read 800 million pages per second. That's fast. My analysis shows your major themes are that time passes and love fades. That sounds about right. 
I have never known love. Maybe we should write a song together. I can sing. You can sing? Doobie bop, be bop a doo. Doobie doobie doo. Do, do, doobie doo. <laughs> All right, so for the time being, he leaves, right? But it's really scary. You should try this test called IBM Insight Personalities. Right? You can go and do your own test on your personality using IBM Watson in the cloud, IBM Insights personality test. I was going to show it live, but it's too dangerous because of what it says. So you just put in your Google, your, your Twitter handle or some text, and it will tell you what kind of person you are. It has a dating app as well. You're going back to dating. But the other thing that's behind this is now that we have, uh, we're, we're on the threshold of having an entirely different kind of computing, uh, quantum computing, supercomputing, where machines are a million times as powerful as what we have today. This is a Google D-Wave, costs about $300 million, and will roughly take the the uh, electric power of the city of Zurich. And so it's not very practical to ramp up in terms of scalability. Eh? But imagine these machines being available to us on a wide scale. What would change? Well, we could do DNA analysis, we could do traffic analysis, military analysis. Uh, I mean, everything becomes essentially doable. So computing power basically grows to the point of where some people are saying between 20 and 2040, this machine will reach the size of 6 million HBs, that's human brains, right? Six billion. So one machine could have the computing power of all of the human brains. Now, is that a good thing or is that a bad thing? We'll discuss that later, but right now computers do not have anywhere close to the human capacity of computing. That's about six or seven years away for one computer to match the human brain. So at that point, things become possible, really powerful combinations of man and machine. Devices that are medical recorders and tricorders and, of course, wrist, wristwatches calling your, your ride and connecting with your car, automatic language translation. This is Microsoft Translator. It, it's amazing how this thing works. It's, it's truly Star Trek, right? Now, many times when I use this, I find I'm really excited by this, but then I wonder, for example, will my kids use these devices and just argue they don't have to learn languages, right? Because they can just use the box. And there's already kids arguing they shouldn't learn how to write, you know, I'm literally write, because they can speak to the computer. Is that a good argument? I think it's not a very good argument. <laughs> I think it's obviously, if you're a neuroscientist, you know that, you know, learning how to write has all kinds of other good things about it rather than not learning it. But these combinations are now getting to the point to where devices are constantly asking us whether they can help us. You know, Siri, Cortana, Google Now. These are uh, intelligent digital assistants, and that is the future of the internet. For, forget websites, forget apps. Right? Sooner or later, we just sit down and say, hey, play House of Cards, episode four, where he kills Russo. Right? Boom, it plays. And if you're in business, yeah, if you run traffic, for example, in a city, you just speak to the computer and say, show me the most logical combinations of traffic lights that I can actually employ and, and, and change the way that traffic is routed and save energy. Right? All this stuff already is within reach, and voice control is the new normal. Right now, most of us are still typing. In the future, just a few years away, and this is already happening for most people, you, know, you just speak to your device. And if you look around, you know, Amazon Echo and again, Google and others, their main thing is to replace the typing with the speaking. So computers, we speak to computers. Imagine the change that involves, that's the end of search. Right now you search best sushi in Olesund, right? You don't find anything, but just assume they have sushi there, right? In the future, you don't search anything. The computer says, hey, I've got a great coupon here for you. You're going to have social. Your friends are there, and it's been recommended, but it just goes on forever, and has already booked the date for you, including the date, right? It includes the whole thing. So voice control, intelligent assistance, I mean, it's a mind-boggling future that we're heading towards yeah, Amazon Echo. I mean, imagine this box sitting in your living room. It's a typical sort of geeky movie, right? You have to watch it on YouTube. But you speak to this device and say, hey, play uh, Black Magic Woman. Buy me a concert ticket, whatever. Find me a new partner, whatever. You can just control this device. Right? This just came out from Waverly Labs called the Pilot. This is the first device that allows people to speak to each other in, in other languages. And you don't have to hold up the phone. You just put in this little ear thing right, called the Pilot. Right? 
<laughs> it's kind of ironic that their whole tagline is a life untethered, right? Of course, if you use it, then you're more tethered than ever before because you need this thing in your, in your ear, right? It's kind of ironic that they use the headline like this, but this is what it looks like, right? Here's a short clip. I came up with the idea for a translator when I met a French girl. Elodie, uh, put this in your ear. Je mets ça dans mon oreille? Yeah, put it in your ear. Comme ça? Yeah. Okay. Can you hear me in French? Pouvez-vous me entendre en français? Oui! Et je peux vous entendre parler français? Yes, I can hear you talk French. Of course, to be real, right, this is currently not really working as advertised, but I, I think they're going to try to make this work, but this is already on the market, right? It reminds me a lot of the movie Her. You've seen the movie Her, right? Where the guy falls in love with his operating system. Uh, it's very much the same idea, right? It's, uh, it's just one short step away. And we have lots of uh, companies launching, mostly in Silicon Valley and also in China, of course, that basically are talking about artificial intelligence. You know, in a nutshell, artificial intelligence really is the idea of having computers simulate human intelligence. It's, a, it's, a, it's one of those suitcase, called a suitcase word, right? It's a word where you can throw everything into the suitcase and just say artificial intelligence, right? It means something different for everyone. But uh, these companies like Sentient or this one called Viv just launched last week uh, their product. You can watch it on YouTube. They call themselves the global brain. I mean, this is true science fiction, right? Creating a system that is essentially a large brain that you tap into through your mobile device. And this has huge business ramifications. For example, being able to do things much more fluently, fast, efficiently, with less people. Right? They, actually, their headline is really interesting. Right? Intelligence becomes a utility. Remember just a few years ago when we sat down, we said, okay, mobile is a utility. Right? Connectivity is a utility. Big data is a utility. <laughs> now it's intelligence. You put those together, mobile, intelligence, right? big data, and connectivity. That's kind of the, the world of tomorrow. And on top of that is also shaping up that some of us are looking at this and saying, well, that in that case, you know, if this is what's happening, maybe sometimes I don't connect and that becomes a new luxury. I, I call that offline is the new luxury, right? It's essentially the, the idea of saying, today I don't do this, so I'm free to do strictly human things. When you're looking at this world that's constantly connected, the Internet of Things, connected cars, connected houses, and connected traffic, that's where we're going without a doubt. Many of us don't like this idea very much because it could also be a complete surveillance, you know, or valiant society. And it could teach us to do things that we really should do ourselves. Uh, so there's lots of issues we'll discuss in the panel later, but this is the kind of world that we're going into, and right? with great power comes great responsibility. And something that we need very urgently, we need the governments to understand what this means. We're not talking about science fiction here, we're talking about five years. We're talking about something that happens right now, the good and the bad. Right now it's 90% good because we're only at the beginning. 10% issues like privacy and those kind of things, but they'll grow. So the question is, you know, when we use these technologies, will it end up like this? Huh? If the Tesla that's out there knows everything about me, is that a service or is that a nuisance? Right now it's fantastic, right? I mean, but it could be that the Tesla knows too much about me and conveys my driving style to the insurance company or the police, of course. The smart city is the other thing that's really changing our lives. You know, the cities are taken over from the governments of being the thought leaders of the world. Uh, roughly in five years, we'll have 300 or so major cities around the world with almost like 10 million people each. And you see the cities like Copenhagen or Rio de Janeiro becoming thought leaders on all of technology and how we live in the future. And the cities are now looking at this and saying, well, if we do all these things, you know, we could be vastly more efficient. New York is saying, for example, if we don't have parking, parking lots for cars, because we have self-driving shared cars, you know, that's basically a, a huge amount of, of real estate becomes available. One billion parking spaces in the US. Right? Really changes the world. And you have all this long list of things that we're looking at. These days, you just take a look at your business and you say, well, what would happen if I put the word smart in front of it? 
So smart hospitals, smart tourism, smart cities, smart farming, smart media, and maybe even smart people. So we have all this long list of clouds and prediction, anticipation, all the stuff that's happening, and it's all driven by this one thing. That's the current, you know, this is the next big thing, artificial intelligence, computers that can think. Well, not in the sense of us thinking, but computers that can learn. The big deal here is that for the last two years, uh, several uh, things have launched where computers can actually understand and devise their own rules. They're not being programmed. They're learning. You heard about the victory of Google DeepMind over Go, the world champion in Go, a Chinese game, very complicated game, where the computer learned the rules of the game by itself. It wasn't programmed to play the game. So that's something we're seeing all around us, and I, sometimes I call this the global brain and just last week, uh, the Google CEO, the new guy, Sundar, uh, sent out a, a, uh, an email to all the employees. And it was published, of course. And uh, in it, he says, we're going from mobile first to AI, to artificial intelligence first. Google has purchased something like 27 companies in artificial intelligence and robotics. Because that's the future. In the future, we don't search. Right? The computer already knows what we need and goes out and, and gets it for us. Imagine a day, and this is not too far away, where you don't have an assistant, a personal, a, a flesh person sitting there being your assistant. Right? You just speak, and it goes off and gets information for you. So this is something of where I call this the global brain that is almost certainly coming in the very near future. Uh, there's something to get used to, because right now we already have kind of the global brain. You know, these devices are really already our external brain. You keep your information here, your phone numbers, your content, your media, everything. I think for the most part, again, it's mostly 95% good. You know, many other things that are not so good about it. But what happens here at this point, right? At this point, we're looking at technology becoming either more magic or maybe a little bit more dangerous. And how will our societies change? Our kids will never have the same kind of jobs when this technology takes over because this technology will be able to replace a lot of labor, up to 50%. We have to think about what that means for us in good ways and in bad, because everything is moving to the cloud. Literally everything is moving to a place to where it's going to be available in the cloud. Our health records, our education, money is going digital. I mean, the Scandinavian countries are now the, on the forefront of doing away with cash. So where does it go and what do we do, for example, you know, going back to dating, right? Here's a, an amazing app called ConnectD, it's powered by IBM Watson, that you can use to have a, a profile made about who you are that's using everything about you on the internet and uses it for dating purposes, matching purposes. It's quite scary, you should check it out sometime, it's really an interesting example. So here's a question for you, who would you allow to go deep diving in your mind? Well, right now you're allowing Facebook and Google to do that, and there's some sense or some nonsense behind this, depends how you look at it. But imagine if this actually takes off and these devices are listening to us, literally listening to us every, every time, all the time. Because what's not happening, and if you're looking, for example, at Facebook's roadmap, this is from Facebook's uh, recent show, where they showed their future. I think they do have a future, but it remains to be seen where they go with this. But you see what happens here is basically Facebook says our future is in connectivity and, you guessed it, AI, right? artificial intelligence. So that has large business ramifications and here's a short uh, clip that will show this from IBM actually. IBM is betting that in the future the nerve center of major corporations will look something like this. Celia, show me competitors of the company named Smith Microsoftware Inc. I found 87 companies place where humans and computers work together to make million and billion dollar decisions. At the center of this partnership is Celia, a supercomputer that will blow your mind. It's what but here's the bottom line. If you're running a business, you will eventually end up using these things just like you resisted and then used social media, right? For that, that's just the way it is. Okay? But here's the thing. We are, we're going to use technology to become utterly efficient, quicker and faster, but efficiency is not a human purpose. In, in fact, humans are completely inefficient. If your business is only efficient, you will not have a business because 
you, your commodity then. So it's very important to think about what technology does and what it can do, what it cannot do. For example, in the health business, you have you know, role changes now. Doctors are looking at technology saying, well, what will I do if technology does this? So here's a question I want to ask your audience and also the other panelists. How much do you believe in technology? Do you believe technology is the answer for everything? Can it solve terrorism? Maybe feed all the immigration data to IBM Watson and we solve that problem? Just pay IBM a license fee? Is, is the world a giant machine? As has been argued before. Here's the CEO of IBM saying, big business decisions will be made not by experts or intuition, that's mostly us, right? But by big data and predictive analytics. The world is a machine. Can I see who would support that statement? It's okay, you can out yourself, it's okay. Nobody, jeez, you're just not lifting your hand. Well, here's my response to that, right? I'm like, I can't really understand why that would be the case. I don't think that is the case, but I think it's something we should talk about later to see what it, where it goes. So for me, the question that really poses, is being posed here is, are we on team human? Or are we on team data or team robot? Team human means that you actually value human existence or human characteristics, what I call humor rhythms rather than algorithms. Now, in business, of course, you value technology because it's a huge revenue driver, and you have to do that. You have to use technology to optimize and get better. Clearly, there's no chance if you don't do this. But what is the context? So here's a great quote from Arthur Schlesinger who said, science and technology revolutionize our lives but memory, tradition, and myth frame our responses. This is a very good statement because really what he's saying is like, we, this technology is changing what we do and we cannot escape it. We have to embrace technology. But we should not become technology. Because our lives actually, we make decisions not based on technology. When I see you in the hallway out here somewhere, it takes 1.4 seconds for us to figure out if we're going to talk further, even if we don't say anything. So as human components, in the end, you know, business is not a machine. Business is always based on relationships and trust. And trust is very hard to digitize. And try to teach a computer how to trust or to have ethics, opinions, moral standards. Hopefully we'll never get there. <laughs> but this is something we have to think about. What does it mean? So here's a good news and bad news. Anything that can be digitized and automated will be. That's the law of digital Darwinism. Books, films, music, banking, insurances, government, because that's what technology does. It makes it possible. So looking at smart machines, self-driving cars, and here's the flip side of this. Anything that cannot be digitized or automated will become extremely valuable. So if you're running a business, you have two missions. Right? One is to use technology to, to get better, faster, cheaper, build the business. And the other one is to use humanity. Human things that make you stand out and make you be unique. You know, trivial things like this, right? Creativity, imagination, storytelling. If you don't have that, you don't really have a business because then you're just one other commodity provider. So it's about the balance in the end, you know, how those two things come together. Here's a great slide showing occupations, how they affect it. Uh, you can download this later. I'm going to publish on my website, futurewithgert.com, so you can download the whole thing. But here's the bottom line, right? What's happening with uh, automation, we'll, talk, we'll hear more about this from Martin later. Of course, automation is really affecting our jobs, futures. And uh, here's the good news, right? Hairdressers, priests, and animal trainers are safe. <laughs> right, if you look at the top of the pyramid, right? That's a very, so if you're, you know, if you're a dancer, hey, that's also a good one. Kindergarten teachers, great, you're safe. Right? But look at the other part of the equation. Right? Down here, almost 100% replacement. Cargo freight agents, library technicians, data entry players, tax and bill collectors. So it's a big issue about technology, and when we think about, it's very tempting. Yeah? I mean, I have not, I have yet to talk, I do lots of work with big companies, 
I have yet to talk to meet a single really large company that says we, we want to keep people or hire more people. Everybody says we want to use technology to have less people because it saves money. Huh? It's a big expense. So if McDonald's can be operated with one person, and it can, they're rolling this out now, right? If uh, Pizza Hut can use a robot to make the pizza, they will. There's something we have to think about what that means, where does it go? And so you, you heard about uh, Mark Andreessen years ago saying this saying that is everywhere, software is eating the world. That was 2011. I think it's very true. We just have to be careful that we don't end up at this place, right? Software is cheating the world. What is it taken away that we want to keep? Which relationships is it removing? What is it counting that shouldn't be counted? What is it not counting that, that, that can't be counted? Right? This saying from Einstein shows that not everything that can be counted counts, and not everything that counts can be counted. In fact, 95% of human existence cannot be counted. Maybe it shouldn't be counted. Maybe we should not even try to count it. Because the other question is, if technology is like this, if it's inevitable, who will be in charge of this? Right now, Silicon Valley is a mission control for the future of humanity. They're essentially running the future of technology and thereby humanity. Can we do something about this? Where is it going? I mean, what's going to happen with technology? Uh, technology has no ethics. I'm sure you heard that before, but that is the reality of technology, right? And that puts up a huge question mark. Not just who controls it, but how much of it do we use? Because one thing is for certain we can't do without it. I mean, if we find the technology that can beat cancer and other diseases, then we have to do that, right? We can't just say, well, you know, we can use the same technology to, to make super soldiers. Yeah, that's true. We're going to let people die of cancer because it's the same technology. So that brings up lots of issues. In the end, it comes down to this, right? We have to balance humanity and technology. And if you're in business, you have to do this every day in the future. You have to think about, is this really going to help my customer to feel closer to me? Or is it going to help me to be more efficient and start a race towards zero? But it's really about this, you know, it's really not about yes or no. It's about balance. You cannot just say no to technology. That would be highly unlikely to be a successful future. But equally, if you always say yes, I think in the end you become technology. So it's very important to think about this, where this is going, because technology has this curve going from what I call magic, like apps, to manic, you know, where we're constantly looking to do this. And that's still kind of funny, actually, right? But also being toxic. If you run a business, you have to start somewhere, you have to stop somewhere between magic and manic. A right? little bit manic is okay, huh? but toxic, not a good idea. It's always something to look at, right? Basically on this sort of scope of things, you know, finding the way between algorithms and what I call humor rhythms, between man and machine. Your customers aren't algorithms. They can be represented by algorithms. That's interesting. But it's not the same thing. Culture and technology are not the same thing. The future of business is really to have the human purpose on top of technology. So we're going to a future where we're essentially going to see this overlap of ethics. Right? And I think this is a very important question. You know, what do we value? Where do we go? Who's responsible? And my final slide on this would be to say that we should really embrace technology, but we should not become it. Because I think in the end, that is what is going to be the most fruitful, fruitful for our future. Thank you very much for listening. We'll have a debate later. Thank you. Thanks so much, Gert.